In this video, I'm going to show you how to find the slope or the derivative using numerical methods, specifically the central difference method. We will need to determine the slope or the derivative for a number of biomechanical variables, including things such as velocity, acceleration, rate of force development, and power. Recall the definition of slope is going to be the change in y divided by the change in x. And let's say that I have position, which I have located here in column B, and time, which I have located here in column A, and I wish to determine the velocity. Well, we can say that the velocity is going to be equal to the change in position divided by the change in time. And I'll be able to calculate a velocity value. However, we have to be really careful in terms of how we interpret that velocity value. Recall again that this equation here for the slope being the change in y divided by the change in x is going to be the average slope. So this velocity value right here does not correspond to 0 0.01 seconds. It also doesn't correspond to 0 seconds. It's going to correspond to something halfway in between 0 and 0 0.01 say maybe 0 0.005. Now, it can become quite cumbersome to try to add an additional time column in for every value that we have to calculate. So in order to alleviate that problem, we are going to use what is referred to as the central difference method. For the central difference method, recall that I told you that if you wanted to find the slope at a particular point in time, we would need to find the point that would correspond right after that particular point and the point that was right before that particular point and then find the slope in between those two points. And that's what we're going to do over here. We are going to say the velocity at 0 0.01 seconds is equal to the point immediately after 0 0.01 seconds minus the point immediately before 0 0.01 seconds. And we're going to divide that by the time point immediately after 0 0.01 seconds, subtracted from the point immediately before 0 0.01 seconds. And that's going to give me the velocity or the average velocity that occurs between 0 and 0 0.02 seconds, which we say aligns with 0 0.01 seconds. And we can go ahead and we can drag that all the way down. Now, you'll notice here that I do not have a value at 0. Also note down here at the very bottom, you'll note that my velocity is decreasing as my time is increasing, but then it jumps up really high to 25.6 because I don't have any data point here in which to calculate that value. So what I have to do is I have to go ahead and I have to get rid of that data point. Now in biomechanics, we don't necessarily like to get rid of data points. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we have at least a padding frame on either side of our time to account for that. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to come over here and I'm going to insert a row and then I'm going to insert yet another row for reasons that will become clear here in a second. So down here, I'm going to end up increasing my time. And I'm going to take my position data here, and I'm just going to keep it constant for those two points. Now I'm also going to say that my position was constant for these two data points up here. Remember, this was what my initial point was, so I'm just going to highlight that. So now I can calculate my velocity at that point using the same formula that I used before. And I'm going to take the position immediately after and immediately before and subtract the time immediately after minus immediately before. And now I can say what my velocity would occur at that point in time. And again, I can kind of move that up and I can turn my velocity here. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm actually just going to
state my velocity to start with here is going to be zero. Now, why did I add two rows of data as opposed to just adding one? Well now, let's say that I need to calculate out my acceleration. Well, the acceleration is going to follow the same formula that I use for any generic slope. So if I want to know the acceleration at, say, 0 0.02 seconds, I have to say that that's going to be equal to the velocity immediately after minus the velocity immediate before and divide that by the time immediately after minus the time immediately before. And then again, I can bring that all the way down. So now I can take this formula here and I can move it up to determine what my acceleration is here, and then I'm just going to say it's zero in the time before. And that's exactly what we had to do for our velocity here. Now again, anything before my yellow line right here is just going to be padding frames. These are things that I'm not going to be concerned about the data. I'm just going to use that to help set up for when I need to start being concerned about the data. And then same thing down at the very, very bottom of my data down here, is I can extend this column down here. I have to remove this data point right here in order to determine what my ending velocities are going to be. And again, our last point that we were interested in was this one right here. So these are just padding frames down here that allow me to calculate my last velocity and acceleration points here and here. Now there's one other point I'd like to make about the central difference method. And that is this works particularly well if our time steps are fairly small. And by fairly small, I mean 0 0.01 seconds or even smaller. Once our time steps get particularly large, we cannot use the central difference method anymore. In that case, we'd have to create a new time step column for both my velocity and my acceleration. So how exactly would I do that? Well, let's pretend that my time steps were fairly large and I was not confident in my ability to use the central difference method. I'm just going to take my acceleration data here and I'm going to insert another column to move that over. And now I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to delete this velocity data and I'm going to recalculate it. And here, I'm going to say that my velocity is going to be equal to my change in position divided by my change in time. And again, I can bring this all the way down. But again, I've run into a problem where I would say that this velocity here does not correspond with 0 0.03 seconds. It's going to correspond with something that occurred between 0 0.03 seconds and 0 0.02 seconds. So that means I have to create a new time step column, which I'm going to say is going to be equal to the time at that particular velocity. And that time at that particular velocity Well, let's start up here. That's going to be equal to the average time between these two steps. So you'll see that my velocity here now corresponds to a time that's halfway between 0 0.02 and 0 0.03 seconds or 0 0.025 seconds. And because we're going to need this for our acceleration, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to send that all the way down my column. Now let's go ahead and delete our acceleration data and let's recalculate it. Now remember my acceleration is going to be equal to my change in velocity. divided by my change in time. But what time am I going to use now? I'm not going to use my original time data because that does not correspond to this velocity. 
So now I'm going to have to use my new time at velocity data, and I'm going to say it's going to be equal to this value minus this value. And I can go ahead and I can send that all the way down. Now we have another issue, because this acceleration does not correspond to this time. It's going to correspond to something halfway in between 0 0.015 and 0 0.025. So I need to create yet another time column for my time, for my time at acceleration. And I'm going to say that this data point here is going to be equal to the average of this and this. And again, I can start bringing this down, and you can see where this acceleration data is now going to correspond to this new time. And I'll send that all the way down, and that's going to be important because we will need that for graphing purposes. So you can see it becomes really tedious if we cannot use the central difference method. So whenever possible, we want to make our time steps as small as we can so that we can use that central difference method. And there you have it. That's our central difference method.